George, welcome to uh, uh, NAMM uh, 2020 and uh, the Dolby Atmos uh, Lounge here. Um, it's great to be here, Kerry. Thanks. So tell me a little about, about yourself and what brought you in to, uh, to Dolby World. Well, you never really escaped Dolby World. I've, I've found over the years that there's always something that Dolby has to offer because your research is deep. Dolby is always a leader in any given field and uh, certainly a leader in, in theater, in theater sound. And uh, the effort to do this is probably the injection that the record business, whatever that is, needs to move ahead. Certainly it gives us opportunities. I'm talking to David a little bit about what I feel like my role is. And I feel it's to explore this space and to find the best, the best impression, the best tools, the best workflow. Um, this new palette uh, is fantastic. I mean, it expands our mixing palette the same way 5.1 did, but even more. There are future opportunities, but I, I think it's pretty good the way it is. I think right now, and we were talking about this, we would really like to understand how better these personal devices work, the, the Echo Studio in particular. And what we'll need to make is a compromise between a fully immersive listening room and a shoebox listening room. Well, we're hoping to uh, not have too many compromises in there, but uh, understand. It's... But there's always a compromise, and, and that's the thing, is to make the best compromise and the most artistic compromise, not just a technical compromise. So what do you see as the main challenges in that? Uh, you've been doing some, some mixing with some uh, pretty high-profile artists, and uh, what are the things that have... Uh... Well, the, the biggest challenge, as you know, is playback to the artist. Um, we, we can't depend on putting a small personal device or... or even worse headphones, even the best headphones, in the artist's hands and having mixed feedback. The artist really wants to hear it at its best. So starting there, I think if I had a basic precept is that you try to mix for the best case. You try to mix for the, the biggest space, the biggest sound, the, the most interesting sound. In this case, the most immersive sound. Telling a story, this, this opportunity to tell a story in space has a tremendous uh, have tremendous possibilities there. And I think the artist needs to hear that. But the artist is not necessarily going to hear that on headphones. Right. Yes, we have to do headphones. Yes, we have to do earbuds. Mm -hmm. But I think that next step is artist playback for mixing. So you've worked across a wide variety of genres in, in your career. And uh, do you think that uh, this might fit into any one of them in a, in a more, more exceptional way than others? Well, we don't really know, and that's what's interesting, is we have to experiment. We have to go out and try things and fail, uh, because we all have to admit that we fail 99 out of 100 times. Making any progress means failure. So going out and trying a genre, even if it's a genre we're not familiar with, it takes a bit of experiment, and I think that's what's next. So, um, <clears throat> Obviously, you're, you're an inventor as well as, uh, um, as, as, as a mix and you know, mastering producer. Um, what, uh, uh, what things are inspiring you? Uh, to what, what, what triggers your, your creative juices in that sense as well with, with this? Well, one thing in particular is I'm hoping for better uh, reverb simulation. Uh, for years, we've been hoping to have a powerful enough uh, DSP engine to be able to vectorize reverb in a real space. Vectorized meaning we come off of an instrument in 360, hit surfaces, and come back in 360, and, and determine one of a myriad of paths for early reflections. Because we really believe all of our research has led to this idea that early reflections um, support localization better than just about anything else in, in a complex space, in a space that's unknown. So uh, there's some processing that I'd like to move ahead on for this space. And it's not five channel, it is definitely, you know, 11 channel processing. So you're, uh, you're doing a lot of research and, uh, and education at, uh, at McGill. Um, you know, are you working with the students uh, on these immersive technologies? Not yet, because we're not set up. At, as you know, we're, we have a room coming online and it's, uh, I've learned a lot working at Blackbird about what we need in this room because right now we have smaller speakers in the back and I don't, I don't think that's going to work for us. So we're, 
reconfiguring, rebudgeting this room. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> to try to um, get a foot up on getting student students into a great environment right from the beginning, and not have them. Uh, wait for us to experiment too much with mistakes or heading down the wrong direction. And we want to get a good room up. Yeah, so the students students, students have to hear it right. They really do. And they have to have their attention drawn to the differences between good and bad work. So um, you, you, you mentioned the speaker size. Um, do you feel that's something different about Atmos um, and this immersive uh, technologies um, than even 5.1 was? Well, 5.1, we wanted to have the same size speakers no matter what. And I believe we do in the Atmos playback as well. We want seven, nine speakers that are pretty much the same. We, we want that to be the same. We don't have that at McGill yet. We're hoping to have that. I think it's important. Now, putting a lot of horsepower in the air, I don't know, maybe it's an experiment because we've got a bunch of ATC 25s, which we were planning for our big 22 setup and for the <coughs> Atmos setup. Uh, but I don't think that's really going to work, the 25s. Okay. Yeah. ATC will be very happy <laughs> to know we want more. So have you been moving uh, a lot of things around in these mixes or are you generally using the space it's been requested that we move stuff around. So the idea is to listen to it and see if it's meaningful to the story, you know, having some kind of random element to the story of the song or not. If it's not, we move on and try something else. And this is what takes time, you know, with the, the uh, stereo source panning that we set up. Took a little time establishing objects. And, oh, it was a great education, Carrie, and I really appreciate it because I was able to, with this new mix, do my own work on that. It's great that the numbers line up. Yeah, it's very, very helpful. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the new, the new render. So um, you, you referred to the song as a story. Um, do you feel that's you know, a, a key to creation in music? I think it's a key to uh, gripping an audience by the heart and by the guts. Um, is to have a story that they can relate to. This, why this could be me, or whatever that is. And I think uh, songs, the best songs, have some sense of story, personal story or personal history, a relatable sense of history. I don't know, it doesn't, I'm not a songwriter. Maybe you are. But it doesn't come to mind what kind of song I would want in particular but a setting, uh, I, I really love the opportunity to have an, an acoustic setting, an immersive acoustic I'm, I'm in a club, I'm in an arena, I'm in a, an atrium. And having that be the foundational uh, setting for a story, I, I think there's more opportunity now than ever with, with that loss. You mentioned you the, the, the Room of Blackbirds. Um, tell us a little more about that for people who are maybe unfamiliar with it. As if you were unfamiliar. Um, the Room at Blackbird is something I've been dreaming of since reading a uh, Manfred Schroeder paper 50 years ago, to, no, 40 years ago, in, in that to take the boundaries of the room out of the listening space and retain diffusion seems to me to be a no-brainer. It seems to me that's what a control room should be, is, is a um, acoustic whiteout, if you will where the room doesn't contribute tone or timbre itself, is neutral, no spectral reflection. So that's the inspiration. I started building these rooms at the complex in 1980 and noticed when I did, mixing got easier and more relaxed. The room response, spectral response was flatter. And the room at Blackbird is a result of my meeting John McBride and his sharing that dream of what would be the ultimate room. That doesn't mean it's it's the most popular room, uh, and we really had a long fallow period where it sat doing country music, which is not very imaginative for mixing. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and then there's this great opportunity to you. Uh, we knew it sounded great, by the way, in five one. We yes, have people in there. It's brilliant. This works. 
But that doesn't sell studio time. Studio time is based on other perceptions, yeah. So when when we heard that room, the minute I heard that room, I, I felt redeemed is the best word. I'm not quite there yet because it's not really a revenue stream yet, but redeemed in the sense that that's what that room was supposed to do. I, I was certainly relieved to see you happy with the room. Well, I, was, <laughs> I was happy, I am happy, fantastic. thrilled with the room. That's great. Um, and obviously that speaks into, you know, the, with all of the, the, the diffusion and treatments that are uh, possible in there, you really hear what's coming out of the speakers. You really do, yeah. Well, the reverb becomes uh, very important uh, to be able to analyze critically, so uh, it's great to hear. It that. does, and you can hear the reverb because the, the ambient response of the room is imme immensely neutral, just yeah. neutral, neutral, not immensely neutral, but neutral. Um, <laughs> Immensely, but the uh, the ability to hear all those different colors more clearly, to separate reverbs, to be able to hear a reverb coming from here compared to there, that's great. That's great. I love that. Well, thanks so much for spending some time with us here. And, Appreciate uh, it. Thank you, George.